started. I'm Brad Stoner, I'm the Department Head for Public Health Sciences, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone to our very first joint uh, seminar presentation between the Health Services Policy Research Institute and the Department of Public Health Sciences at Queen's University. Um, I'd like to begin our joint seminar presentation today by acknowledging that Queens is situated on traditional Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. As uninvited guests, we are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. I do welcome all of us to continue our collective work towards preserving and sustaining these lands for future generations in Kingston and across all Turtle Island. It's my privilege to welcome Dr. Catherine Donnelly to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Donnelly is the director of the Queens University Health Services and Policy Research Institute. Thank you very much, Brad. Um, it's great to be able to do these jointly. It's a test run of radical collaboration. <laughs> so our first speaker, Dave Clements, is an executive director for the Dimensions Health Research Collaborative and senior advisor, innovation strategy and policy for health. Queen's Health Sciences. He holds an MPA from the School of Policy Studies at Queen's University with a concentration in health policy, as well as a BA from the University of Victoria. He also pursued doctoral studies at BU University Amsterdam. Dave has over 25 years experience in health policy planning, strategy communications, and stakeholder partnership engagement. He has held senior roles in organizations, including Health Canada, CIHR, Sky High, as well as this Canadian Health Services Research Foundation. In 2014 and 2015, he served as Executive Director of the Federal Advisory Panel on Healthcare Innovation and has also served as a Senior Advisor and Communications Director for Canada's Minister of Health. Uh, Ron Shore is a research scientist with Queen's Health Sciences and postdoc fellow at Public Health Sciences at Queen's. And he's been involved with Queen's for over 16 years. Ron has taught drug studies, psychedelics, and public policy at Queen's University and the University of Ottawa. And importantly and impressively, he's the founder of Kingston Street Health, which is impressive in, in Kingston here. He has an MPA in health policy and has spent 23 years in frontline harm reduction in public and community health, starting as a prison outreach and needle exchange worker in 1991. I will pass the floor over to both of you. Welcome everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay. If folks on Zoom can't hear okay, just uh, indicate in the chat and Nikki has guaranteed us that she can address all of that. She's a pro. So I want to thank Brad and Catherine for inviting us here today. It's an honor to be the first in what I'm sure will be a really successful uh, series here. So I'm going to start just a little bit. Ron and I are going to move back and forth. Um, you'll notice I don't look like my photo on the slides. It's because uh, I couldn't look exactly like Ron, so I've <laughs> shaved off the beard, which is the pro or the con that many people don't recognize me anymore. Um, and my wife tells me I no longer look my age. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> there we go. So as all good ethical researchers should do, we just wanted to declare some conflicts first and foremost. Um, this is also a reminder to me to help uh, or to remember to recognize the organization that is founded the Dimensions Health Research Collaborative. Uh, they're called Dimensions Health Centers. It's a, a great credit to them that they made a charitable donation towards creating this research collaborative. Uh, they could have done a range of things. They could have contracted with us to do research and what they opted to do instead was to, to make a charitable gift uh, to create this platform that allows Ron and I to do the work that we do and to do work with others. Uh, and uh, and so we're, we're very grateful for that. It's also a reminder to me to note that uh, while I have spent the last two decades in Ottawa and have worked for the federal government for a period of time, I just want to note I do not represent the government of Canada. My views are not the government of Canada's views. Uh, and similarly, the government of Canada's positions may not be my personal views. So it's just a, a reminder that uh, uh, of that context. And also to note that Ron has uh, consulted and been compensated by private psychedelic companies uh, in the past, and his uh, PhD uh, work was supported uh, through the Dimensions Health Fund that we reference here. Okay, over to you, Ron, for defining our terms. Thank you. 
Hello, everybody. Thank you for your interest uh, in this topic. Um, psychedelics are something that has caught the popular attention. There's a lot of conversation around it. It's interesting as someone who studies the science and then as Dave and I try to evolve kind of policy and program frameworks is definitely the popular interest and in the hype exceeds, you know, what we can say is as good peer reviewed science, but there's no doubt that the promise of psychedelics is real. And that even just from a scientific perspective and from a human curiosity perspective, what we can learn through psychedelics, through their investigative properties and even just human consciousness and how the brain works is quite fascinating. So you have the, just the pure science side. And then more interestingly, I think for most of us, they're looking at the implementation. How do you apply what we're learning about psychedelics? And within that context, we're going to refer to a little bit the drug um, toxicity crisis. We would have what most people acknowledge as a mental health crisis with growing prevalence of mental health disorders, struggling with ineffective or limited uh, effectiveness in treatment. And then just even our whole notion of what these diagnostics mean and how they connect with each other, depression, anxiety, PTSD. They're not necessarily empirically based diagnostic criteria. So we're struggling to make sense of mental health, particularly in the time of a global pandemic. So enter psychedelics. And there's an enormous amount of interest. Um, for me, it's always interesting because I'm a drug researcher. I've been involved in illicit drug use related community health and harm reduction work for, for going on 30 years now. So to me, psychedelics, I've always thought psychedelics that these are drugs. And that doesn't mean that drugs don't have therapeutic applicability. Opioids are a perfect example of that. So you can have something that's both naturalistic or recreational use, but also something that has a therapeutic potential. So what we're trying to get at in this seminar is as we look at the emerging science as it comes through, what's our policy framework? Where are we going to go with this stuff? But just to start by defining our terms, psychedelics are a loosely grouped category of a number of compounds. Some people, I'm a purist, I like serotonergic psychedelics. To me, I like the natural psychedelics, so peyote, psilocybe, mushrooms, ayahuasca. You'll never compare with nature's botany in terms of the ability of these plants and the entourage effect of the multiple compounds. But we've also got a lot of interest in pharmaceutical science in our society. The quest for new antidepressants. So people are playing with psilocybin to take away the visual effects, altering LSD to be shorter acting. So we're playing with these molecules. But all in all, it's a, it's a broad category that includes the serotonergic psychedelics I mentioned, but also things like ketamine and MDMA. People may know MDMA in the street name ecstasy, and perhaps you would have used it in a, in a kind of recreational context. But also, you know, what I want to get at, if we're looking at shared subjective experience, right? So you have this altered state of consciousness. How often in our health kind of scientific discourse do we talk about mysticism? Do we talk about altered states of consciousness? So you're going to notice there's not a lot of new coming in here. Now, as a society, we're evolving the literacy in the terms to make sense of some of these things. But if we're going to talk about the mystical side of psychedelics, I think most of us are going to go, what is mysticism? We have a relatively secular humanistic society. How does this kind of play out? So but they have this in common. They have a shared experience. It's an immersive experiential experience. It's profound alterations that are time limited. So there's a, there's a sense of a, an experiential component to this. So they come from multiple families, but what they have in common is generally serotonergic agonism. Serotonin, serotonin is a neuromodulator more than a neurotransmitter. It's really helping to regulate a lot about what you do, even in terms of sleep, wake cycles, uh, appetite. Um, but we know it's associated with mental health. And, and there's controversy whether serotonin, uh, serotonin dysregulation or deficiency is, is, is the cause of depression, but we know there's some sort of association there. So there's serotonerg uh, serotonergic agonists for the most part, but they have a downstream effect on GABA and dopamine. And this is where it gets really interesting. And we don't get too much into the, the neuroscience, but this is kind of how we define them. But the, the very psychedelics, what we know, we can group them together because they have a common discriminatory, uh, discriminative stimulant effects. So animals or humans will respond or substitute one for the other. So they have a common experience. And part of what we want to do is look at not just the science here in terms of Western biomedical science, but look at our anthropological literature. Look at the study of human culture. Look at things like ayahuasca traditions, peyote traditions. And you're going to see there that it's not just, you know, this kind of notion of like a, a neurobiological kind of effect and kind of these things, but these are also experiences that are cultural that are often common, people share them in common, and they have, they've had historical use in bringing societies, societies together in terms of bonding, but they're considered visionary plants. So part of what psychedelics have is this potential promise that we can learn something about ourselves through these very unique experiences. So already you can tell in terms of a health discourse, we're using a lot of unusual language here. And this is part of the challenge of psychedelics in terms of how we move forward. But here's your classic psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, DMT is a psychoactive component in ayahuasca, but also harmalines as well. Atypical psychedelics, I mentioned MDMA and ketamine, and then entheogens is an important term. 
because psychedelic is really a relatively modern term that came out of the 50s. And it kind of refers to this class of drugs and its ability to kind of manifest the mind. But entheogen is more like the, the, a plant spirit. It's more of a relationship with nature. You get into these more anthropological traditions where ayahuasca or, or the mushroom would be seen to have a spirit that a person is communicating with through these experiences. So again, stretching our boundaries in the West a little bit. Most of the way this is getting played out in the Western discourse, and before I go on, I should have asked, anybody read the Michael Pollan book, How to Change Your Mind? Okay. Yeah. It's, it shaped a lot of people's understanding of psychedelics for, for good and for bad, but it's, it's definitely out there. But there's a lot of interest in what's called psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. This is being called a new paradigm of mental health. It's a new paradigm of psychiatry. The bulk of the research in the psychedelics has gone on through departments of psychiatry at academic institutions, largely out of a scientific curiosity, but also to contribute to new forms of treatment, particularly novel therapeutics for depression, substance use dependence, and then end of life anxiety, existential distress. There seems to be a real application for psychedelics. But I'm gonna go over in a minute just how many clinical trials are in process. So you have this notion that they can be used as a catalyst in therapy to accelerate therapy, to make it more robust, to maybe make it more experiential. In the case of MDMA, MDMA-assisted therapy, it really helps repress the fear conditioning. If people can develop better therapeutic alliance with their therapist, it's particularly effective with PTSD. But we also have this anthropological tradition, which I would call ritual ceremonial. This is when people gather together in their communities, and they would, it's not so much an individual psychiatry perspective as it is a visionary experience or a cultural experience. And Dave's gonna talk about some things happening around the world in particular, Oregon has legalized psychedelics and they've started a, what's called an Oregon service center model where people come together and have these kind of access to these kinds of things. What's really coming to the fore more and more with the literature and what my thesis really got into was the cognitive gains or model behind psychedelics. So people have probably heard to some degree some of the rumblings that psychedelics are associated with neuroplasticity. They're associated with cognitive flexibility. They seem to accelerate, accelerate behavioral change. So in, in my thesis, what I looked at was all of the literature, animal studies and humans and developed a cognitive model to show in the way in which psilocybin in particular disrupts habit. And habit is always learning. It's, it's always like added, it's, it's, it's affect. So it's your emotion, but it's also behavior and it's your thinking pattern. So psilocybin disrupts that and puts pause on your past conditioning. And for about a 30 day period, there's this afterglow period, which opens a critical period in neuroplasticity. You're simply a little less bound by your past conditioning meaning the chance for behavioral change and improve reward learning in that 30 days period. It's very significant and can accelerate what we would call the, the therapeutic gains or changes people make. And they help with something called long-term potentiation. So the changes people make in those times are more likely to stick simply because of this window that happens. And you don't exaggerate it. It's not like it's you're a whole new person, but there's something different about your brain. There's a, there's a bit of a reset in the way that your brain communicates with each other. And you've probably seen some of the the diagrams on your kind of brain on psilocybin compared to not, and there's a lot more connectivity, global connectivity. And what I found in my literature is there's a lot more connection to your body. And there's a sense that somatic embodiment is higher after psychedelics. You're less ruminative, less in your prefrontal cortex, kind of ruminating over things. And you're more present in a sensory way in your immediate environment. And we all learn through our immediate environment and learning is often social. So it helps accelerate. People feel more accepted, more open, more connected to nature, to each other, to themselves after psychedelics. So you can see the way in which that can help with both learning and behavior change. Psychedelics today, just to give you a bit of context, Dave and I were going over some of the prevalence data, how widespread is psychedelic use? We don't really know. It's still illicit. The surveys in Canada have some methodological concerns, but they find it around 2% of Canadians in one year. I think that's really low in terms of people who would use psychedelics. And maybe just we're biased given the work we do. But here's one Irish study, this is a re relatively recent study, people seeking mental health care, 27% reported past uh, psilocybin use uh, in this regard. And then you can see here during the global pandemic, people were most likely increasingly turning to psychedelics. And you can see in this one international survey, they found that it helped people deal with the stress of, of the psychedelics itself. But we know we're in the middle of a psychedelic renaissance. There's a boon in the science, the literature coming out and the rate of publications I do this for a living and I'm overwhelmed with trying to keep up with all the new studies. It's like every day, there's like more and more and more and more. One of the things you have to keep in mind is this goes up. We're also in a bit of a crisis in academic publications, predatory journals. There's a lot of journal kind of problems, you know, and, and even just as a case in point, and you do knowledge synthesis, I help write a section of a report. I relied on systematic reviews to kind of help me make some conclusions. I realized only in retrospect, a number of those articles had made errors. So it's just the quality of publication and some of the things coming through, as much as there's more and more, some of them are really methodologically problematic. 
particularly some of the self-report surveys. Okay, we're going to get into that a little bit, but you're seeing a huge boon in publications and we're trying to make sense of this, come to some conclusions. Canada's got a rich history in psychedelics. Most people around the world would look at Canada as a leader in this area, more advanced than many countries. I'm not sure if that pans out, but you can see in our colleague, Erica Dickett of Saskatchewan has done some brilliant writing in Canada's early uh, work with LSD, particularly Waver in Saskatchewan in the, in the 60s and the 50s and early 70s. LSD was really seen as a novel and effective therapeutic for alcoholism. And the outcomes were pretty good. That it's a little bit dated, but you can see at one point, the first waves of, of academic literature, at least 10,000 articles, that peaked and kind of came down in around 1970, 71 to 73, when you see the increasing criminalization and prohibition of psychedelic compounds uh, through, the, through the Western states. Record use of Canadians today, you can see here it's um, lifetime, it's about uh, 12%. Uh, higher among males, ecstasy is around 6.4%. Um, I wanted to raise this issue with cannabis. You see how widespread cannabis use is and the growth in that. There are many people who consider cannabis as a psychedelic, particularly a high dose cannabis can create the same kind of in states of interiority and altered state of consciousness and what's called an oceanic boundlessness in your consciousness. And so there's some literature that, that advocates for high dose cannabis as a psychedelic as well. And there are many psychedelic retreat centers that will use cannabis as a psychedelic as well. We haven't technically grouped it in, but I just wanted to kind of bring that into you for now. Good. I'll pass it over to Dave. Thanks, Ron. So it's over to me to talk a little bit about what is the context? What is the world in which this is happening right now? and why. I almost titled this section, if psychedelics are the answer, what is the question? Uh, and Ron and I say this to each other quite frequently, like, why? Why is this happening? And why is this accelerating so quickly? And so I wanted to maybe help to talk through or think through uh, some reasons why maybe there is this focus right now, this tremendous focus on psychedelics. First thing I would just note, I think, you know, especially in a public health setting, it would not be responsible to not reflect on the fact that we are in the midst of an epidemic of poisonings that relate to opioids, okay? We've seen latest data we just saw from BC, uh, BC coroner's office suggests that there's a tenfold increase from pre-pandemic uh, levels of deaths that are related to opioid use. Right? We have to note that we're in the middle of an ep epidemic that people are not, as much as we're talking about it, are not talking about and reflecting on it as much as we should. I can gauge how cool this crowd is by saying, who's the person in the top right corner? My son says, I asked this question at a, in a, a group of OBGYNs in Atlanta and nobody knew that, that was Father John Misty, who my 17 year old son informs me regularly microdoses. But all this to say, everything on this slide is from the last two years with the exception of Michael Pollan's book. Although arguably we could say the pickup on Michael Pollan's book has been much greater in the last two years. So tremendous social use. You are more likely than not, especially if you're paying attention to these kinds of things, to see references to the use of psychedelics and microdosing in particular in your favorite TV programs uh, by very famous people and so on. And this appears to be only picking up. So there is this notion among, to begin with, influencers and then to the broader public that this is something that is in the milieu, so to speak. A couple of, I just wanted to excerpt a couple of the really heartbreaking emails uh, that I, we received. Uh, this was a note that, uh, that arrived in my inbox you know, shortly after taking this job from a mother who is dealing with a 27 year old son who has tried everything in a treating mental health and addictions issues. I won't read it to you, but you can read it yourself. I have highlighted though, a couple of the things that, that highlighted her reason for contacting me was to say, I read Michael Pollan's book I've watched podcasts by Theracil. I've read uh, Gabor Mate, and I am now convinced the psychedelics offer hope. We had no hope, we now have hope, right? This is really critical when we wanna ask ourselves the question, why is there such an appetite, an increasing appetite for psychedelics? Because people are hurting and they're often people who have tried many things to deal with their pain and that has not worked. I just received this note a couple of weeks ago on route to the conference I mentioned in Atlanta from a 33 year old person who was a victim of a car accident, uh, who was hit by a driver who was not insured and does not have access to the health care that he needs. And he's telling, he's saying right here, look, I'm struggling. I'm not the father or the husband that I want to be. Is there any help you can offer me at all? You know, any help? And I think what's interesting here, and I've referred to this many times, is he's noted 
I'm going to do this. Based on what I've read, what I've seen in the popular discussion, I'm going to do this, right? I've made the decision. And I think those of us who have worked in harm reduction in the past need to reflect on this. When people are saying, I am doing this, what advice can you give me? So don't tell me no, don't tell me where the better options are, I've made the decision. And I think we need to ask ourselves, what is the right thing to do uh, with people in this situation where we have a duty to reduce harm? So you will all know that Canada is a signatory to a 1971 UN convention on psychotropic substances that effectively led to uh, countries that signed that convention introducing legislation which has scheduled psychedelics as illegal drugs. I won't get into the details of the different schedules, except to note that in, um, in Canada, MDMA and ketamine uh, are classified as a schedule one drug, which effectively indicates that there is no, no legitimate use for the purpose of improving human health. Okay? It's not quite as strict as the way the DEA deals with it in the US, uh, and all other psychedelics are scheduled under schedule three. Okay? Um, I would also like to note, though, that when Canada legalized cannabis in 2018, and I was a part of that initiative, uh, there were also changes that were made in relation to research involving cannabis and research that relates to the use of other illicit drugs as well, which has in many ways permitted um, additional research to be taking place in Canada in the last three years. I won't go into the slide in great detail, except to say, when people ask the question, what would it take to get psychedelics you know, legitimized for human use for improving health in Canada? What would you need to do? Uh, people need to understand that this is the framework that those folks who are entrusted with the responsibility, what we call delegated authority on behalf of our political decision makers, the people who work in the health products and food branch, this is the framework by which they work, right? Um, they very much are in the phase three, phase four uh, part of this diagram here. So, once they have assessed a submission from a manufacturer that says, we can attest that this drug, we have the data to prove that this drug is primarily safe, but also that this drug is effective. So if it is safe, it's not going to hurt people. Uh, and it actually does what we claim that it does in the drug monograph. Right? This is what binds the officials at Health Canada to making decisions about what medicines are available and what is in fact considered to be a medicine. So this is important, an important factor in the political and legal context. A couple of recent developments. Um, and I wanna note these things uh, largely because they have been broadly misunderstood. Um, you will find references online to what these various decisions mean and many of them are wrong. So it is true, for instance, that Health Canada uh, provided exemptions for patients starting in August, 2020 who were dealing with end of life anxiety and depression, largely in the cancer population. What that does not mean is that psychedelics are legal for people at end of life, okay? It just means that some exemptions from the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act were provided. In addition, exemptions were provided in December of that year for providers to possess and use psilocybin. This does not mean that providers have been accredited and they are allowed to work with psilocybin. What it means is that for the purpose of their own clinical training, they were provided with one-time exemptions to be able to hold and use these drugs for a period of time. Okay, so it's important to understand. Similarly, earlier in this year, there was a lot of focus on decisions by Health Canada to make changes to the special access program. This has been interpreted very broadly as providing a rapid avenue for the use of psychedelics. And while in one sense that is true, it's important to note that the Special Access Program is a long-standing program that is primarily designed to provide access to Canadians who have no other uh, treatment options to drugs that have been approved in other jurisdictions, okay? So this was really important in the 1980s in the worst part of the AIDS crisis when we had experimental drugs for people who effectively were dealing with the death sentence. And the special access program was really important because it allowed their physician to present that data to Health Canada and say, please let us use these drugs that are not yet approved. That's how the legislation was designed and how it works. It, is, it can be used now for people who want access to psychedelics, but it is not a specific avenue that has been created for, the, for access to psychedelics. Uh, it's also important to note that research funding has increased dramatically, Ron noted the publications. We can note that philanthropic organizations in large part have been responsible 
for the funds that have allowed researchers to do their work. Okay. In Canada, we have seen some of that funding, but we have now also seen public funders devoting increasing funds in this area. Uh, researchers, if you're in the health realm, will know you have the option of applying to the project competition at CIHR, which is for investigator-initiated uh, research. We are seeing research in that so-called open competition that is investigator-driven involving psychedelics is being funded by those review committees. And now for the first time, we've actually seen a focused program will provide, it's only $3 million, but that's quite significant, uh, coming from Health Canada through CIHR uh, to provide for uh, research teams to do clinical trials of two years focused on these uh, core areas of priority, substance use, uh, major depressive disorder, end of life psychological distress. So what's going on internationally? So many of you will be familiar with the fact that Oregon has effectively created a access to psilocybin regime through approved health centers model. And they are dealing with all of the issues you would expect to have to deal with in a case like that, such as how we access the products, uh, how we know what the dosages are, who can uh, prescribe or dispense, where the drugs will be held, all of those kinds of things Oregon is working through right now. And Colorado, as of last week, has moved with an Oregon-like example of establishing approved centers. Interestingly, though, um, while Colorado has legalized, uh, they have um, uh, they are still working within provisions that exist federally in terms of access to to psychedelics. Right? So there are some issues that they will have to work out in terms of um, who can use these things and in which settings and who can provide and hold and so on. Um, a lot has been made as well of the FDA providing what's called breakthrough therapy designation for MDMA. Again, you may read that and understand the FDA has made a decision with respect to how it values psychedelics. That's not what has occurred here. We've had many breakthrough therapy designations in the past. What this effectively does uh, is that the FDA provides uh, a focused team to work with manufacturers to help them through the remaining stages of the approval process. It doesn't accelerate. It doesn't um, alleviate any of the, the hoops that manufacturers have to go through. But what it does is create a very significant and sustained dialogue, in this case, with MAPS uh, in the U.S. The other thing I would just note, and I could put an asterisk on every one of these, um, but these are countries that have some degree of legalization or decriminalization. Um, oh, I should also note in the U.S., you may have seen focus on a bipartisan bill introduced last week by uh, Democrat Cory Booker and Rand Paul, uh, which is looking at a rescheduling of psychedelics. Again, I would just note all that proposes to do is to reschedule psychedelics from Schedule 1, um, specifically psilocybin and MDMA, to Schedule 2. So that's basically saying either that there's absolutely no possible benefits to human health in Schedule 1 to treating it the way we treat cocaine in the United States. Okay. So just to understand what's what's going on. Uh, so these other countries, there is access to some degree. I, I won't go into all of the caveats, but the Netherlands, um, I'm Dutch and I'm Canadian, so I probably understand the Dutch system pretty well, but actually uh, magic mushrooms are illegal in the Netherlands, but truffles are not. Right? Uh, similarly, we have countries like Jamaica or Bahamas that never actually made um, psilocybin illegal. Right? Uh, and we could go into you know, all of the cases uh, that might be asterisks on so economic context, what, what do I mean? I would just note very rapid acceleration in investment and startup businesses in Canada. Uh, over 100 companies, the last time uh, the person I, I worked with here has counted, and it's probably greater since then. It's these slides that we create, and they're here, uh, are out of date practically by the time we create them. And in fact, there's at least one company here that doesn't exist, and there are at least three more uh, that, I, that I know of that aren't reflected on this slide. So what you're seeing here is an ecosystem of people that are looking to basically uh, operate in this space, even in, with the current legal status of psychedelics, but in particular to be prepared for what changes may or may not come next in Canada. And finally, technological context. So what do we mean here? Well, where is this going and what are some of the challenges? Some of the things that I would foresee is that uh, drug companies, and we're already starting to see this, are looking at existing psychedelics and trying to understand, you know, could they reformulate these things? Could they look at something that has an MDMA with a better safety profile is something I have heard repeatedly. Uh, are there, you know, can they drive new synthetics that may be able to accelerate through the approval process, but may not have some of the baggage of longstanding uh, psychedelic drugs, at least from the view of regulators. 
Um, use of the whole mushroom, Ron could talk about that at great length. There are some significant challenges there for the regulator as they look at questions such as dosage, or as they look at which, actually, which molecules are actually there. Uh, whether you can do what's called good manufacturing practices, GMP, which is one of the core requirements for drugs that are approved in Canada. Um, additionally, one of the things I would add is uh, disentangling the effect of just good access to therapy versus the actual effect of the molecule. Separating those things is a challenge because we're talking about something that is highly synergistic. If you look at the MDMA trials in the U.S., what you will find is people with post-traumatic stress disorder who did not have access to MDMA that about a third of those did very well and didn't have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder following the 16 weeks. So that tells you something. That tells you know, it's about two thirds of the people that also received MDMA. But that tells you there's something in the synergistic effect. There's also something about appropriate therapy being provided to individuals. Uh, and who's going to provide that therapy? Finally, we have a significant access. You will know we're in a mental health crisis in this country and internationally. It's very difficult to access psychiatric or psychological care currently. Finding people who are accredited or properly trained to provide this type of therapy is an even greater challenge, potentially. Back to you, Ron. Thank you. Now, I know we've only got about half an hour, so I'm going to just briefly kind of synthesize the state of the literature, and then Dave's going to explore four different kind of regulatory scenarios. So I'm just going to direct your attention. If you are interested more, this report is available on our website through the Queen's Health Sciences Psychedelics Collaborative. You can see this is a Queen's involvement. We get three students plus myself involved in this. It took us quite a while, but we reviewed 1,600 publications on psychedelics, and we're able to make some kind of conclusions or observations based on that, but I would direct you towards that for more um, specific information. But just to point out, there's a lot of new clinical trials happening. In my research, I synthesized 13 clinical trials and 50 years of animal research and the amount of clinical trials out now, which I covered 15 years, the amount that's going to be published in the next two years is going to dramatically exceed what was published in 15 years prior to that. But you can kind of see the areas of interest. PTSD is a big concern, uh, depression, substance use disorder. These tend to be mental health conditions that we have poor treatment efficacy for, or limitations, or great heterogeneity in how people respond. Women respond very differently to antidepressant medications in males. So these are all areas that we're interested in, in analyzing from just a scientific perspective, but from a clinical application, there's a, an enormous amount of expectations around psychedelics. So these clinical trials, you'll often hear people say, well, if you need access to psychedelic therapy, try to get into a clinical trial. So that's true, but clinical trials are designed for the scientists, not for the patient. There's so many limitations on these, so many exclusion criteria. It doesn't necessarily provide access to people, but you can kind of see at the time of our writing, there were 77 clinical trials, and this does not include ketamine. And if you read over your, our report, you'll see why. Ketamine is a whole different thing, and I'm not going to get into too much around ketamine, um, but ketamine literature overwhelms the rest of the psychedelic literature, largely because there's a lot of ketamine use that is non-psychedelic. It's an interesting drug. Some debate whether actually it's a true psychedelic. It creates a, a temporary psychedelic-like situation. And there's ketamine-assisted therapy, which has kind of come out of the underground psychedelic movement. But I'm just going to ignore ketamine for now to look at the more classical psychedelics. So you'll see kind of 77 trials in process now. And in a review of these 1,600 publications, we are able to kind of summarize a little bit the weight of the evidence. So what do we know about treatment efficacy? Well, first of all, there's promise. So we have to remember we're not into stage three or phase three trials where you're looking at overall treatment effectiveness. There's some happening in the UK, but we're still in phase two, generally speaking, with psychedelics. And then remember, after clinical trials are kind of completed, there's still more investigations. Then you have the whole implementation side and the development of best practices. Even within psilocybin-assisted therapy, there's no agreement yet on the therapeutic dose range. We have an idea of different things at different doses, but from a clinical perspective, there's still variance in how we look at dosing, although there's convergence towards a kind of general theme. But you can see here, we're interested in PTSD, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders. Psilocybin and MDMA are far ahead of any other compound in terms of the regulatory kind of process here. Uh, but there's interest in things like 5-MeO-DMT, LSD, obviously, as well. And in the clinical literature on ketamine is vast, as I said, given its applications. But it, it's problematic in the sense that when you look at ketamine-assisted therapy and you look at systematic reviews and longitudinal studies, while there is a very rapid onset of an antidepressant effect, it does not appear to be sustained or persisting. So it may give people a temporary boost. Ketamine is really good for uh, acute suicidality and in emergency department. Its role in psychedelic assisted therapy, to my view, maybe you disagree, it's a bit of a placeholder. You'll get clients like Field Trip who want to do psychedelic assisted therapy. They've set themselves up as a ketamine clinic 
with the hope of popping psilocybin in what psilocybin is approved. I'm not sure ketamine and psilocybin are the same modality. I don't think they are. And I don't think a, a clinic that does one is necessarily be great at the other, but you can see there's a bit of a substitution phenomenon happening there. But the evidence here is pretty good. It's promising, but we need more rigorous studies. Generally speaking, the safety is, is clear. These, it's, it's very hard to overdose on psychedelics. Uh, biologically, they're very non-toxic. The leading adverse experiences are things like nausea, post-session headache, uh, acute rises in blood pressure and heart rate. But most significantly, it's an adverse experience called transient anxiety and distress. People are familiar with the concept of a bad trip. The, the, this notion of this kind of anxiety that can kind of kind of rise to people as, this, as the drug has its effect subjectively. It has these physiological stimulant effects. It can make people a little nervous and then your perception of the world starts to radically change. And that can bother a lot of people. In particular, I think for people who have active PTSD, it, those, kind of, those kind of visuals can really trigger things that are less, less positive in terms of more negative kind of a invasive kind of phenomena. So we're a little bit careful with acute PTSD when we come to serotonergic psychedelics like psilocybin. But you can see the safety is strong. It's really just that, that, that possibility under drug effect of either erratic behavior, panic or anxiety is real, which is why you need to really address the setting. You know, the setting that has to be customized and appropriate for psychedelic therapy. Trained therapists who are competent and capable, even things like informed consent are radically different in psychedelics. The issue of touch is problematic. We have had experiences of therapist abuse in Canada within clinical trials in psychedelics. So patients have a state of vulnerability and susceptibility we really need to uh, protect. But it's their preparation and their aftercare. So the model that's evolved is what's called PSI, which is preparation session integration. I spent a lot of time learning about psychedelics, how it's going to work, getting your kind of emotional and, and psycho psychological set together. And then after the session, there's usually integration sessions that help you kind of make sense of the experience, decide where you're going to go with this. And so that's generally the kind of model that's emerged. But one of the things I'm really interested in is, you know, we talk about clinical trials and all the science, but the reality is most people are using psychedelics recreationally with, within their own, in, own, in their own home or with friends. And I really think much like with alcohol and cannabis, we need to develop low risk use guidelines. So people understand if you're going to use psilocybin uh, and there are psilocybin shops and online, you can order psilocybin. It seems to be a tolerated gray area right now in Canada. So really like how do we make sure that we're reducing the risks and harms and maximizing any potential benefit? But critical considerations you can see in terms of research, psychedelics are a little bit problematic. It's impossible to blind. First of all, if you're trying to do a, a blinded study and you have one cohort getting psychedelics, and the other getting a placebo and it's not active, it's really obvious who's on psychedelics. <laughs> so, but think about the way that it's going to affect scoring, assessment, um, the, the author team, everybody, the patient experience. So it's really hard to look at uh, psychedelics because it's hard to blind. And then you have, because it's a form of therapy that blends kind of psychosocial support and psychological supports with the molecules and it's kind of drug properties, which is which? Are people getting better from the therapy or are they getting better from the psilocybin? If you look at the psilocybin alcohol use trials, which are really compelling, and as someone who spent a lot of time around addiction, psychedelics have great promise because when you have, uh, they're one of the few areas that the severity of your addiction actually predicts a better therapeutic outcome with psychedelics than with not. And for someone who dealt really hardcore straight and bold kind of people with multiple addictions to think that the severity of their addiction actually may be a benefit walking into this is a little bit of a heart opening for me. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it, they're challenging from a scientific perspective. Um, it's hard, there's expectancy bias. So in the alcohol trials, as I was gonna mention, people were demonstrating considerable benefit even before they got their psilocybin doses, but even more so after. So there's a, that's called an expectancy bias, right? So those kinds of things are, are, um, are very interesting. And then just one of the neatest things about psychedelics, and this is a term that comes out of the literature, is they, they create or in effect what's called an exquisite sensitivity to context. You're just very aware and very susceptible to your environment under, the, under, under psychedelics. So that obviously affects research planning. You need a safe space. Like even Wayne's here, we're looking at starting our first trials. You have to do them in the hospital. How do you disable the alarm system? How do you get the fluorescent lights off? You have someone under a deep psilocybin state who's going to have all these announcements going on and fluorescent lights. It's really problematic and that's more likely to um, kind of set someone up for a, a difficult experience. So generally hospital or based research is, is a little bit difficult unless you can kind of curate a setting. It's a little more specific to the sensitivity to context people have. But we know more and more people are using psychedelics. This is from the Monitoring the Future study of the US. The first curve, the blue curve, you'll see that's, that's people between 19 and 30. And you can see the rise in psychedelic use 
uh, and then it's age 35 to 50 below that. My sense is these are still underreported, given the illegal status of this in many kind of jurisdictions. And I'm just going to stop uh, in a minute, but I want to cover microdosing really quick, um, but I won't go through all the slides. Microdosing is super interesting. It's probably one of the, you know, in terms of questions we get, it's one of the more common questions where people understand what I do. They always generally want to tell me their mushroom stories, which are generally pretty amazing. And then secondly, they want to know about microdosing. Microdosing is challenging to come to conclusions about for a lot of different reasons, but the state of the literature is generally the systematic reviews, the observational studies, and then the surveys tend to show that microdosing does seem to have a benefit. Now, is some of that benefit expectancy? Is it people's committing to something, wanting it to work as a new health behavior? Probably, but it does seem to be associated with less depression, uh, improve, improved sense of mood, but also creativity and problem solving. So, but it's again, also microdosing is really problematic. Because what do we mean by microdose? Most people who talk to me about their microdosing say they're starting to feel things or visualize things, or they got anxious. That's not microdosing anymore because microdosing is by definition subtherapeutic. So then you're into low dosing or very low dosing. But I find people don't like to talk about drug use. They want to call it microdosing, but there's also okay to talk about the fact that we use drugs for these kinds of things. But microdosing is a little bit uh, interesting. I won't go too much into that, but generally the surveys report benefits. Surveys, again, there's limits to surveys. So I won't go too much into it. But the controlled trial findings, 10 observational studies, you can see um, re reported changes in time perception, increased stimulation, distance from ordinary reality, sense of peace. Uh, improvements in mood, energy, cognition, increases in convergent and divergent thinking, increased open-mindedness, but you can see increased anxiety, neuroticism, and a cycle of depressive and euphoric states with people in microdose. And I'll leave that for now and hand it over to Dave to explore some of the regulatory models. Okay, so a lot of the questions that I get and we get, as you can imagine, um, maybe it's more than me because of the time I spent in government, everybody wants to get a sense of where is this going? Uh, will psychedelics be legal? How will that happen? Um, and I should probably start by quoting the Nobel laureate Niels Bohr, who said, prediction is very difficult, especially when it's about the future. Uh, I think if we were to look at cannabis as an example, and the same could be said, frankly, for looking at the past. I've heard many explanations for why cannabis was legalized in Canada that I think only partially explain why that occurs, because there are many interacting factors. If we go back to that pest analysis I gave you earlier about the political, social, economic technological factors, there's a lot at play. So with that said, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and I'm gonna provide you with four distinct scenarios that I believe actually in practice will not be distinct. I think there will be elements of each of these, but it's useful to think through some of the ways by which the regulation of psychedelics I think may change in the coming years. Um, so I would just know first of all, that I think in the short term, the things that we know is that public interest is likely to grow. I think we could also say here that we're likely to have some high profile negative experiences. Anecdotes are very powerful, especially when they arrive in the wake of optimism or over optimism. So I suspect some people will have adverse events and I think those will be highly publicized as well. Um, I think uh, governments will face challenges as they deal with what really are models. I mentioned health products and food branch earlier, models that were not designed to deal with this. When uh, HPFB was asked to approve Viagra, uh, that's one thing. That's a lifestyle drug. That's something that is designed to improve people's, people's quality of life. Uh, but you didn't have a case where 20% of Canadians had already recreationally tried this for 30 years. And people were able to speak very openly about what their experiences were, right? And I won't even get to using cholesterol drugs or something as an example. So it's quite unique and it challenges our existing tools. So really, scenario one for me that you may be able to envision would be what I would call the ongoing medicalization of psychedelics. So I think what we would see there is the number of trials continue to increase and we see more and more phase three trials that show safety and efficacy for a range of psychedelics. Manufacturers then take these novel formulations that I referenced earlier and submit a monograph to Health Canada and seek what's called a notice of compliance. So the ability to be able to market the drug, right? And if that's successful, and remember the drug would still be scheduled just as heroin, heroin and ketamine that are also prescribed are scheduled in the CDSA, it doesn't change their legal status from that perspective, but they can be prescribed by a doctor. They are on what's called the prescription drug list. Then what would happen is you move into the realm of the provinces. The provinces need to decide, okay, this is now available. It's a marketed drug. Who has the ability to prescribe this drug and oversee the treatment of patients? 
Um, interestingly, Alberta is already doing this, even with the current legal status of psilocybin and other drugs. They've already said a clinic will not be able to operate in Alberta unless it's run by a psychiatrist. Okay, so they made the decision. So we have all these health professions, everybody from people who work in rehab to nurses, to nurse practitioners, to docs, to family docs. And they've said, no, no, no it's just these people. Preemptively, we're making this decision. Other provinces will look at this differently. And generally, provinces do this pretty collaboratively. So what they will do is they will go to all of the colleges, the, the regulatory bodies for the health professions, and say, can we talk about how we're going to deal with this? Right? But there will be a decision to limit, to some degree, who actually has the authority to prescribe. Something I want to note here is those colleges, when they make those decisions, will also seek advice from their legal and risk management professionals. One challenge I would foresee is a requirement, if you look at the CPSO requirements in Ontario, for example, to be able to prescribe a drug, you need to have a background in that drug and knowledge in dealing with that drug. You also need to do what's called the effective monitoring of the use of that drug. I think for lawyers that are advising the professions, this is going to be a challenge because they're going to say, how long do the effects last? When could an adverse event occur? Who will be supervising the patient? And when we have literature that says the effects of these drugs may last months or years, how will lawyers who are not well prepared to deal with this guide the professions in the decisions that they make? Scenario two would be what I would call the charter scenario. So many people are familiar, although again, may not really understand R versus Parker from 2000. So just quick history for you. Effectively, you had a Toronto man with epilepsy who basically said, uh, my choice here is to go to jail for cultivating uh, a medication that helps me. Uh, or I can, I can, you know, I can take it or I can go to jail, basically. I can alleviate my symptoms or I can go to jail. And uh, the government basically said the provisions we have, so you can get cannabis, you can seek an exemption. That's where the, the exemptions from the CDSA exist. There's already an, a, an avenue fit for this person. And the court said, no, we actually think what you've done and what you say is protecting public safety is not reasonable. You've infringed on on the rights of this individual, right? So what may happen then is people effectively, and this is already happening, Theracil has already gone to federal court in the summer and said for some of these patients dealing with things like opioid disorder, cluster headaches, end of life anxiety for people with terminal cancer, it's the same situation. So uh, we wanna move along the same avenue. So what you could see here is effectively the creation of some kind of a licensed regime. You could see the government being provided with a deadline as they were in Parker to create a regime for licensing producers and providing mechanisms for getting these medications to patients. The third scenario, this is one of two mushroom shops that have opened up in uh, where I currently live in Ottawa. And uh, so you could see what uh, I was very familiar with from living in Vancouver Island in the 1990s, which was kind of a, either a compassion club type model or a dispensary type model where people say, you know what? We're just going to do this and we're going to see what happens. And I think what you could see there is you could see some cities like Toronto did with cannabis dispensaries, shutting down these clinics that will just keep popping up in different places, right? You'll see some cities basically say, we don't really want to deal with this. You see some police forces say, we don't want to deal with this. And you may even see some cities that say, you know what? I think this is a really good opportunity to grow the economy of our region here. We'd like to be the destination of choice for people that want to operate shops like this. But one of the things I would just note again, People may not be familiar with what BC has done, but they've actually used the exemptions provided under Section 56.1 of the CDSA to actually provide access within a large region to a group of drugs, including MDMA. So what they basically said is, you won't be prosecuted for holding or using these drugs. Still can't prescribe it, still can't sell it, still can't do a range of things, but there's an exemption there, which the province has assumed. Any province could do this, and they may choose to do that in a regional or even a province-wide basis which would effectively provide protections for these types of shops. And then finally, you could actually see the government effectively saying through a group of ministers, and if you recognize this, these are the steps we took with respect to the legalization of cannabis. We could call a task force together. We could look at the evidence that pertains to psychedelics. We could actually develop a, a legislative regime that would allow for the manufacturing, the selling, also the testing, the dosage requirements, the safety requirements, and it may even allow some personal cultivation. Um, I suspect what you would see, as we saw with cannabis, is hand in hand, you would see a step up on penalties for people that continue to float those regulations, selling to minors, uh, operating illegally, any of those kinds of things. But this is certainly something that could occur. And again, my COPPA would be, I think what you're likely to see is probably elements of each of those scenarios should this type of change in regulation or legal requirements occur. And I'll turn the last word over to Ron. Probably just 
turn over to questions. I think I'll just really quickly just go over what I was going to say. But I think your time is best used conversing. Um, just, you know, knowledge translation, you know, clinical trials, basic science is early. What we need to do is get to the point of looking at evidence, uh, implementation, evaluation, best practices. So, you know, we're still early in the pipeline, I guess is what I wanted to point out. And this kind of, this is from an asthma kind of related journal article, which you can see most of the studies that go into developing the science are early investigative studies and the randomized trials. And then we, we fall off and we forget to look at implementation science, including the development best practices. So all that work is still to come. And the only thing I wanted to say as well is there's a lot of interest in decriminalization, as Dave mentioned. Vancouver, as a city council, started that process with the province and, and will use that same section 56. Kingston can do the same. The medical officer of health here can actually apply for the 56, section 56 exemption to decriminalize within the jurisdiction of KFLNA. There are two decriminalization committees in Kingston active right now. It continues to just kind of turn over. And, and, and I'm just pointing out that the, the policy tools are within decision makers reach to make these changes. And maybe that's just more a matter of public pressure, but I'll leave it at that and hand it over for questions. Okay. Yeah. Always questions about psychedelics. <laughs> yeah. Great presentation. I had a question about, you mentioned that there was methodological challenges with the RCTs yeah. in, in this field. Yeah. What were some of the ones that were highlighted in your um, systematic review? Expectancy bias, uh, really difficult time blinding yeah. would be the most important thing. Uh, those are the two bigger ones. Yeah. I was wondering about dropout rates, if it differs between controls and because they can tell, oh, I'm not receiving what I wanted if they yeah. miss, if that's why they're joining these. Trials. No, most of the dropouts occurred for people who maybe had a powerful experience and didn't want to come back for their second session, but I, I don't recall a lot of reporting a dropout for the other people here. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it was a fascinating talk. Thanks for sharing. There's a ton of information to digest there as well. Um, I was kind of curious of what the literature the research is showing about long-term effects, um, both therapeutically and have there been any kind of adverse long-term effects as well? So there's a couple of population health-based studies that look at people over a lifetime and they're American studies, and they find no increase in problematic mental health problems, suicidality, depression, addiction for people who report lifetime psychedelic use. In fact, the theory is it may be a little bit protective in terms of mental health status. That's older literature. I don't know how it's all gonna kind of go here. In terms of long-term studies and the clinical trials, the longest follow-up would be about four and a half years. But what we're finding is persisting and sustained benefit, particularly from psilocybin. So generally the follow-up period is about 16 weeks. Many of the trials will go to six months or a year and you're seeing sustained benefit. The question is, you know, I get asked, will people need a booster over time? I, I would imagine, but you're not looking at a daily therapeutic like an SSRI. And the, and the other thing is, you know, we have so many people on SSRIs right now. The clinical trials historically had excluded people from SSRIs to coming into psychedelic trials for fear of serotonin toxicity syndrome. But as the science evolves, we're realizing some of those cautions were from an abundance of protection. So we're relaxing that because there's so people on SSRIs and S NRIs are now being treated with psychedelics. There's been a bit of a relaxation of that. So how that moves over time, I think, as Dave uh, and Sandy uh, kind of illustrated, today's trials are going to be different. I'm hearing anecdotally more side effects than in other trials and people are stressed. You have a lot of people rushing into psychedelics, people coming from backgrounds that aren't really suitable or coming. Everyone's interested in psychedelics now. Even at Queen's, we're amazing how many different faculty are now involved in psychedelic trials who've never been involved in drug studies or anything like this before. So there's a little bit of a rush to kind of do new studies. So we'll see where it happens. But generally speaking, the longitudinal literature is, is very good in terms of safety yeah, and in terms of establishing persisting effect, with the exception of chemical which also has a risk of addiction of all the psychedelics. It's really the only one. Tanya, as part of the audience, has a question for you. Hi. Um, I actually work in a, a neuroplasticity uh, environment, uh, research environment that's doing some clinical trials in this area out in Vancouver. And I'm currently uh, engaged in the psychedelic assisted therapy graduate program, the first one in Canada. And it's really interesting to hear, um, you know, what's going on in the rest of the um, provinces, and I'm wondering, you know, what your thoughts are around um, university level training for these types of uh, therapies. And also, I'm curious, I'm, you know, I'm in a cohort with all 
mental health clinicians, I'm the only physical health clinician. <laughs> and as a physiotherapist, I'm seeing the applications uh, potentially from a neuroplasticity standpoint with stroke and other physical conditions as opposed to just mental health and wondering how the research is emerging in those areas. So my, my first part would be, uh, first comment would be, we desperately need uh, broader investments in growing the next generation, whether that's in providing therapy, but equally important, if not even more important, is actually the pipeline for folks that are going to do the high quality research that is needed. Uh, what we're seeing now is scientists who are pivoting their careers because they see that psychedelics may add something. What we mm -hmm. don't have is a strong kind of, you know, stream of uh, undergrads moving into graduate degrees uh, with postdoc opportunities available to them. We're not seeing recruitment of, you know, leading stars internationally. We need to start growing the scientists who are able to do this kind of work. Uh, and then I think the corollary to that, again, is when we have good evidence for specific therapeutic approaches, to be able to provide those accredited uh, forms of, of, of having the pipeline of professionals we need to actually do treatment is going to be just as critical. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the neuroplasticity literature, if you want to reach out to me separately by email, I can send a brief. That, that would be really helpful. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. And um, certainly it's a, an interesting emerging field. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt at a, at, a, at a cellular level within the animal studies and in the human studies, the concept of neuroplasticity is consistent and it's associated with the cognitive flexibility and behavioral change. And the, the neuroplasticity, you know, is real at a, a neurological level, but what really seems to happen is it just, the way your brain works seems to get a little bit of a tune-up and you're, you're kind of less ruminative, you're more integrated into your limbic system, which is kind of more your midbrain. You're more present in a sensory, and I'm just saying this because you're a physical therapist, somatic therapies after psychedelics, I think are particularly effective for that reason. But if you reach yeah. out to me, I can share some of the literature. Yeah. Thank you very much. I uh, also work in geriatrics, and certainly I observe a lot of perseveration and rumination of yeah. thinking, particularly in early uh, dementing process. Um, I was just wondering if you know there's been any studies on that population at this time. Well, I do know from the, the clinical trials that age, and in fact, increased age, is a predictor of positive therapeutic effect. So generally, people who are older do well in psychedelics, particularly when it comes to meaning-related issues, mortality, uh, forgiveness, all of those things as people get older are so critical. So there is considerable interest in the palliative uh, community and the cancer community around particularly psilocybin um, for that reason. And I think you'll see that's one of the things that really drives it from just a humanitarian perspective as well. If we can, you know, help with people suffering at end of life, and you're seeing now all the, the controversy around MAID and people don't even have access to mental health services trying to opt into MAID, I think we need to really look at if there's a, there's a role for psychedelics in that prior to getting there. I would agree that uh, certainly end-of-life palliation may be distinctive from the early deventing process where the natural history is still another 10 or 12 years. So. Yeah, thank you. Final, final question with Dr. Johnson, if that's okay. Oh, hi. Thank you. This is really fascinating. Um, I was wondering what, uh, what your thoughts are on the holotropic uh, breathing. Uh, and, and because, as you know, uh, that's being said to uh, be equivalent to the psychedelics. Um, and then secondly, uh, re in relation to Erica's question in terms of the neuroplasticity, do you believe that uh, with, you know, that, that, that could be possible? Maybe you answered that. <laughs> I didn't get it. Thank you. So holotropic breath work really developed through the work of Stan Groff, and it's used within psychedelic assisted therapy circles to emulate or to mimic the psychedelic experience. It is thought to create an altered state of consciousness, time limited through natural breath work means. This has been done through yoga, pranayama, tantra yoga for centuries or not thousands of years. So it's not unusual. Uh, I think my own personal perspective, and I taught in uh, the Missioner Institute has a, a foundations of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy program I taught in, I taught the psilocybin content. I don't believe holotropic breath work mimics the psilocybin state. I think there's other ways to get there, but it's, it's used as a placeholder or as an experiential opportunity for people. So if you're going to be a therapist, you at least understand what the person is going through by at least having a, uh, an altered state through breath work. Um, most training programs will try to get the therapist into having an actual psychedelic experience as well. But obviously there's, there's legal concerns around that in Canada, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a breakfast. <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you, thank you. Ron and, and Dave for a really interesting presentation. I'm just gonna say, it's really an exemplar presentation of like talking about the evidence, but also looking at policy implications too.
not just like legislation, but educational training policy. So really interesting. Um, just want to say thank you for everyone online too and in present. So have a great day.